Greetings to you all. My name is Phoenix, and welcome to Back to Ashes. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you haven't done so already or you're new here and enjoying what you are hearing, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it will also remind you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. For those of you that keep up with the community tab every time I post something, you will know that my computer bit the dust. Basically, it needs a new battery, so I won't have my computer for another week or so. That's Apple for you. So, if the sound is a little weird or off, all of the good programs that I use are on my Mac. So, therefore, that's the reason why. Cool? Let's get on with these stories, shall we? It's been quite a few years since this happened, so my memory is fuzzy, but I figured I would try to piece some of it together. This was around summertime of 2018, or so, so I must have been freshly 14. My grandmother had given me a couple quarters and told me to go to the community laundry room to get a Dr. Pepper from the vending machine. She offered enough for me to get one as well and it was still light enough that I could walk down the sidewalk and get back before the sunset, if I was quick enough. Getting into the laundry room and getting the soda was easy enough, but as soon as I exited the building, a car idling in the middle of the street caught my eye. It hadn't been there when I had gone in. I was already put off by this, as I had stranger danger drilled into my head for as long as I could remember. The car had its windows rolled down, and the driver was a young woman with two older, I want to say maybe mid-30s, men in the back seat. They were looking straight at me and beckoning me closer. I immediately thought, oh fuck no, to myself and quickly broke eye contact and made my way quickly back down the street. As if the car knew the complex, they drove alongside me and pulled into the parking spot next to my grandmother's car. They started laughing with each other, still looking at me and whispering about, I don't know, something. At this point, I was terrified out of my little 14-year-old mind. I walked away quickly inside my grandmother's apartment, locked and bolted the door, and couldn't sleep for the rest of my visit. Nothing came of it, but I thank my lucky stars every day that I avoided anything more than an unsettling encounter. So, weirdos from my grandmother's old apartment complex, let's not ever meet again. This story of mine is gross but with a surprisingly wholesome outcome. I was 16 and working in a locally owned fast food restaurant. Everyone working was teenagers except the owner and the adult man named Fred. I was working the cash register in the front but had no customers. My coworker, a fellow teenage girl, came running up to me insanely flustered, grabbing my arm. She began dragging me to the drive-thru, whispering on the way that I needed to look out the window. The whole thing happened so fast, I didn't even question her. I just did it. There was a grimy little old man idling at the window. His pants were undone, and he was exposed. Now, I didn't stick around and stare at the situation, so I can't say for sure, but... It did not strike me as accidental. I whipped around the corner and darted to our boss and spilled out what was going on. Fred was probably right about our parents' age, 
to my surprise, he didn't say a word. He just bolted out of his seat and out of the back door. Seconds later, Fred came charging around the building, shrieking like a lunatic, running towards the car. The flasher saw him coming and took off. All of us employees were totally shocked. Fred was a really mild-mannered guy. I'd never seen him so much as frustrated, but it had appeared he was going to murder that dirty old man. As teenaged girls, this was our first real experience with a major pervert, so we didn't know how to feel or react. We were all giggling nervously and awkwardly when Fred stormed back in the door. He snapped at us to stop laughing. I will never forget what Fred said next. There are a lot of bad people in this world, girls. There are going to be men like that who try that stuff. And it gets worse. You cannot ever let them get away with it. That man just assaulted you. And it is not funny. And it's definitely not okay. Some things you can joke and laugh about. Sexual assault is not one of them. Then he called the police. Fred is still working at that restaurant, and I sure hope he doesn't retire before my daughter is old enough to get her first job. I grew up in Arizona, in a relatively safe city. Before myself or any of my friends had a driver's license, we would walk around everywhere just to get out of the house and do something. Typically going to Circle K for soda and snacks or Walmart and Target just to browse around. One time when my two friends and I were 15 back then, we were walking back to her house through her neighborhood around sunset. At that time, everyone in Arizona was fairly friendly. So whenever you would pass by another person or group, you would exchange hello or wave. This time in particular, we were walking past a house on a corner that had a kitchen light on where the middle-aged man was washing his dishes. When he made eye contact with us, my natural instinct was to smile and my friend's was to wave. What a bad idea. The man immediately dropped his dishes in the sink and what felt like one second later was outside on the corner staring at us in an aggressive stance with both hands balled in the fists. All of our flight or fight responses were completely different. One friend immediately took off running in the other direction. My other friend just pissed her pants and I was frozen in complete fear. He started charging towards us in full force and I am so grateful that my friend grabbed my arm and we all started running as fast as we could. I was so scared. I was in last place. The man was well built and appeared to be in great shape and had no troubles catching up to us. As I'm running, I can hear his footsteps very close behind me. He reached his hand out and tried to grab a hold of my hair but the adrenaline finally kicked in and I was able to speed off beyond his grip. After a while of running, we realized we were no longer being chased. We hid in safety and called my friend's mom to pick us up and told her what had happened. We gave her the location of the house and all vowed to never go near that house again. The next morning, we wake up and her mom explains she checked the address of the house and someone living there was a registered sex offender. Not sure if it was explicitly because of this incident, but my friend moved houses shortly after this. Our moms all collectively agreed we were not allowed to walk alone around anyone's neighborhood, and that if we wanted to go out, a parent needs to be close by. I completely forgot about this until I was recently talking to one of my friends and she brought this night up. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if this man had gotten a better grip on my hair. But I'm thankful to say we got away unharmed. At 27 today, I carry a pocket knife and pepper spray with me at all times. Stay vigilant, everyone. 
You never know when you will be faced with a creepy encounter such as this one. This is my first time telling this story, so forgive me if a few things sound fuzzy. This was when I was really young, so a long time ago. I remember the day very vividly. I was in first grade, my sister in preschool. My dad was out at work for the day, and my mom, a stay-at-home mom, was home with my sister and me. My mom had gone upstairs to shower since it was the morning while my sister and I were downstairs on the couch watching Bob the Builder on PBS. My sister went outside to the car to get something. The way my house is set up is that our family room, where we were watching TV, connects to our kitchen, which connects to our garage. In order to get to the car outside, my sister opened up the door leading into the garage, then opened up the garage door by pushing a button. She then walked outside to the car, retrieved whatever she needed, then came back in. I guess she didn't push the button to close the garage door, and she must have left the door leading inside from the garage unlocked. Well, she was four. She didn't think anything of it. Probably a half hour elapses, and my mom came downstairs frantically with a towel around her, asking if we had taken her jewelry from the bedroom upstairs. Certainly not me. Although I was a six-year-old girl, I was not interested in jewelry. My sister assured my mom she didn't take it either. Then my mom had asked if I was upstairs at all while she was washing up. No, I was downstairs watching TV with my sister. Why? She told me that she had heard footsteps and whistling while she was showering. She had called out my name, but I didn't respond. At this point, I was a very good whistler. My parents knew I could easily whistle. My sister could not blow a sound. Well, if it wasn't my sister and it wasn't me, who could have taken all the jewelry from my mom's jewelry boxes? Even the one she had lost the key to. My mom wrangled my sister and outside the house in panic, still with only a towel over her. She phoned up the police and my dad. She again asked my sister, are you sure you didn't take it? That your friend and you yesterday didn't play with my jewelry? Again, my sister answered no. The police came and searched the house and my mom's room. Being six, I was curious and confused. So I asked some of the officers what they were doing. Kindly, they explained the procedure. We never ended up finding out who the criminal was. She or he must have came through the garage door, which meant they would have passed my sister and me sitting on the couch. Luckily, he or she only wanted jewelry and not to kidnap children, because the committer could have easily taken us while my mom was busy sharing. I can't help but wonder what would have happened had she or he taken us. Most of our friends and family told my parents that it could have been the painter we hired. We were getting our house painted that summer and we trusted the man painting our house. So we would leave him alone while he went out for lunch or on our boat. Since the robbery, I've been skittish home alone. We got an alarm system, better locks, and a guard dog that same year. I would have terrible thoughts after the experience that a man would come through my window and hurt me or sneak into the house again. My dad would have to show me videos of our breed of guard dog attacking people, with protective clothes on, of course, so I could see that my dog would defend. To this day, I hate being home alone. The slightest sound sets me on edge, and I'll reach for the nearest bat or anything I could defend myself with while I search the house. My mom also had a rough time afterwards vacuuming the house alone since she wanted to hear all the sounds. So, to the man or woman who burglarized my house and took all of my mother's childhood jewelry and special jewelry, I hope we never meet you again. Also, thank you for not kidnapping my sister and me. I felt like I should share another one of these creepy people I came across. 
I'm sorry if this actually comes across as jumbled. This was about um, two years ago. I work at a hair salon and a restaurant opened up next to our store. The food was good and we would stop by there for lunch once in a while. Well, every now and then the dishwasher would come out from the back of the restaurant to watch us. Didn't bother us, just watched us. He always seemed kind of creepy to me from the get-go. Wore a big, clear apron around himself, like a raincoat tarp or something, and just looked grimy. Hair unkept, dirty mustache, really old. One day, I went in by myself, and I was short on cash to get some extra chicken for my burrito. So I opted not to get it. I take my food and go back to the salon. All of a sudden, one of the other employees comes in the back and gives me a thing of chicken. The dishwasher guy came in and he wanted you to have this. Um, great. I was kind of confused by this as the guy seemed strange. You best believe I did not eat that chicken. Well, one day, I'm walking back to my car and notice the cops around. Someone was getting arrested in the parking lot. So I kind of take my time getting into the car. Well, who walks up to me but the dishwasher guy? He tries to strike up a conversation with me. How are you? How's work? Why are the cops here? And my answer's quick. The kicker. Are you seeing anyone? I reply, yes, I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend. I quickly say goodnight and get in my car and leave. Figured it was the end, but... Nope. This is how our meetings went. He tried to talk to me. I'd get in my car. He made sure to take the trash out at the same time I did. I used to acknowledge him, wave once or twice, try to be nice, but it got so repetitive. He tried to watch me in the restaurant, like purposefully walking out of the back. I didn't go as often or would have someone else pick up my food. The big joke in the salon was my creepy boyfriend. We all joked about it. We all knew he put me on edge, but he hadn't done anything bad as of yet. So I just started ignoring him. We would joke about him instead. Well, the dishwasher got even stranger. He started watching me work from the salon window after he would take out the trash, just standing there. Thank God I have a male employee to walk me to my car at this point. And when that didn't work, I'd go to the coffee shop next door and have one of them walk me to my car. I was starting to get anxious about running into this guy because I would randomly run into him. Dishwasher guy came in one day when I was off and seemed disappointed, but he got a haircut from one of the other stylists. Big joke, I got returning to work because he was getting cleaned up for me. Uh, no thanks. Well, the restaurant wasn't doing well at this point, and the guy just spends his days watching me. The day before their restaurant closes, permanently, might I add, the dishwasher guy comes into the salon freaking out that he needs to talk to me. My coworker basically tells him to get lost. She's busy. After that happened, the restaurant closed down, and I never saw that guy again. So, to the creepy dishwasher guy, I hope I never see you staring in my salon ever again. I was 19 and still in college at the time. I've always had a hard time studying at my house, so I would usually go to a coffee shop in the evening or late at night to study. Around that time, I would just go to the McDonald's nearby my house, grab a burger, and stand in one of the booths since it was closer and I didn't want to drive to the city. This day, I was sitting in the booth closest to the bathroom when an older man walks by, probably in his 70s, on his way to the bathroom. He stops to look at me and tells me that he loves my hair. I thank him, go back to studying, but he was still just standing there. He continues, My mother used to have chestnut colored hair like that. She was beautiful. I'm trying not to be rude, so I respond with something generic and go back to work. 
He then sits down at my table, completely uninvited, and begins talking to me about his daughter, who was likely about my age. He goes on and on about how he likes to visit her and play his music for her. He pulls out his phone and tells me he's going to show me a video of her. While I'm not thrilled that he's sitting with me, he seemed harmless and maybe a little lonely, so I just let him enjoy some company. He pulls up the video and shows it to me. To my horror, it's shaky footage of a girl that was likely in her 20s laying in a hospital bed in what appeared to be a vegetative state with her mouth gaping wide open, while he, I assume, was talking and singing to her in the background. He then breaks it to me that she is in a coma. I don't even remember what I said to that exactly, but I think I expressed how sorry I was she was in that condition and tried to call my boyfriend, who was meeting me there after work. It's about 11 p.m. now, and the guy is still sitting at my table, oversharing details about his life with me while I clearly am now completely weirded out and trying to ignore him. He then gets up and I watch him walk out the front doors to a large white van. The man opens the side door and from what I can tell, he had been living in the van. The glimpse I got of the inside showed me a lot of cluttered belongings, such as clothes, bedding, boxes, etc. He crawled in and I thought he was gone for good. I go back to studying for my big math test. I hear the front doors open again and look up. It's him. He walks directly back to my table and hands me a business card. He tells me to remember to vote for him for president and that he's out campaigning, then eventually goes back out to get in his van and takes off. The card just had his name and for president written on it with a cheesy slogan. Needless to say, after that, a couple run-ins with a homeless man, I stopped studying at McDonald's. To the presidential candidate living out of his van, let's not ever meet again. I'm going to tell you my story of a terrifying old creep that has stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm currently 20. So basically, to set the scene, I'm an average height, average size 20 year old female. I've been told I'm very approachable and perhaps too nice to strangers. I sometimes just don't have the heart to tell people to fuck off, and I definitely should. Obviously, I'm not going to give specific details, but I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself and not a store inside it, like me. When I was 16 and first started the job, I was quite timid and awkward and let anyone say pretty much anything to me. I didn't quite know what to say when older customers and other employees would make inappropriate comments to me. I would simply just laugh it off whatever people would say or not respond. In my 16-year-old mind, this was a lot easier to handle. I had one other friend at my job who was my age, and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had, and one day she asked me if I've heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange, she didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling or even someone to be afraid of. Just a very eccentric man. Really, she and other employees would laugh at his odd sayings and awkward behavior. Jessica had also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day. Chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior or harmless flirting. If... He wasn't a 50-something-year-old man bringing chocolates to a 16-year-old girl he barely knows. I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. 
The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees and the restaurant was empty, so this was pretty much the perfect time for a creep to approach without being seen. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center. So he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he is your typical creepy old loner. He was gaunt, had gray hair with bald patches, and had beady little eyes which he never adverted from yours. And I can't get them out of my head, still to this day. Eric must have sneaked up on me as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. I could feel his breath on my cheek. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Hi Lucy, are you married? He almost giggled after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face which made me feel as if he were trying to pretend that he thought I was older than I was. And at 16, I looked 16. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see what my reaction would be, letting me know in his own way that he had been looking up information about me on social media. He would do this frequently. I began to clock on to the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead, stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram. When he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge and had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to. Just to talk to me, he asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite, insert band here, song? Eric relished in my discomfort. You could see by my reaction that I was clocking on to the fact that he had been viewing my personal social media and the thought of that made my blood run cold. I felt disgusting and violated. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was by going through my Instagram page. This creeped me out majorly, but somehow I just forced myself to forget all about it and carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable, and he liked this. This is what he wanted. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that he, Eric, had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me, and this manager informed me that a few years ago, Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl, who used to work for a restaurant, into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep, yet still employed at the shopping center. On one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason. But on the other hand, I was frightened as he's been doing this for years, yet no one had stopped him. Anyways. There was a woman who worked at the same place as me called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability, which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems like Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number, and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her texts with Eric. He had texted her things like, 
Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you set on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, would you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here. I was stunned. This was quite slowly turning into my nightmare. I was constantly questioning why this old guy was so hell-bent on finding out everything to do with my life. Why me? He had gone out of his way to source information about me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. Again, this creeped me the hell out, but still, for some reason, I forgot about it and carried on with my life, which was very hectic at the time. And in a way, I'm grateful that I didn't have the time to dwell on Eric's growing obsession. However, this was something I wouldn't be able to ignore forever, as Eric began inserting himself into my life in ways I couldn't just ignore or brush off. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I must have tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favorite film, because it's a great film, right? Anyways, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face, and the same usual wave of disgust washed over me. He was really making it to a point to let me know he was watching me. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. To someone listening to this story, it may not seem as unsettling to you as it did me at the time, but when someone is going out of their way to make sure you know that they know information about you, you spend every waking hour thinking about what they plan to do with this information and why they insist on taunting you with this knowledge. The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. There was a notification from PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric Stanley, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal account and sent me three pounds with a quote from the movie attached to it. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous phone calls, incessant calls, one right after the other. I was in floods of tears and ended up having a huge panic attack. I felt like there was no escape. My phone rang and rang and rang all night. I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued, and every time my phone would ring, my head felt like it was being impaled with the sharpest knife in the world. I was on complete edge. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, making a point to breathe very heavy. I even swear that they were trying to sound like they were jerking themselves off, which sickened me, by the way. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the links he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all of my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, hurting me or my family? That night, I had horrific dreams in which he chased me around my house and taunted me for hours. I still have similar dreams and struggle to sleep without my boyfriend present, as I'm scared he's standing right outside my door to this day. I reported Eric to the managers, and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they had witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior or times he had been inappropriate with them too. 
Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management, yet nothing was done, except the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he had outsmarted me, found a way around the rules, if you will. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved cities as I went away for university and made new friends, which distracted me from my old life in my own hometown. I still thought Eric every now and again, and when I focus on it for too long, I can't be alone. I had a fear that he is still keeping tabs on me. The thought of that just terrifies me. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot all about the twisted little man who used to obsess over me at my old job. I forgot he existed, but I was soon going to remember. On Christmas Day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed, and I expected it just to be another message from a friend or a family member, but I was wrong. I received a notification from PayPal, and it was the exact amount of three pounds, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, Sending on behalf of Eric. My blood ran C-O-L-D again. I had forgotten all about this man and all he had done to make me feel unsafe and definitely unsettled. And here he was again, antagonizing me, yet this time doing it through other people. Perhaps his way of telling me that him being banned from talking to me himself won't stop him from entering my world. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the rest of the night drinking with family until I forgot about the notification. I probably should have told someone about it, but I just wanted to do as much as I could to block him out. I didn't want him to control me anymore, and I since haven't seen or heard anything from him, and I wanted to stay that way. I think Eric still works at the shopping center and lives local to me. I avoid my old workplace so I don't have to see him, and he doesn't have to see me. So, to the creepy, beady-eyed freak that made me live in fear, along with many other underage girls, I hope you get caught and locked in prison for the rest of your life. So, this happened maybe 15 minutes ago. Here's some backstory. As of four months ago, my wife and I live in a certain metropolitan city in the southern east coast of the USA. We will just call it our city. She has been a native all of her life and I a native 500 kilometers north. We have eaten out downtown for special occasions like our six month anniversary a few months ago. One of these restaurants is a fancy Thai one we tried on a whim, and it was amazing. I run a small catering business that cooks specifically to teenagers with stage 2 outpatient anorexia in the parents. It's a tiny niche, but I'm proud of it, and the backstory behind that is relatively odd. Okay, on to the meat and potatoes. Now, this weekend, I'm up in Philadelphia by myself attending my cousin's wedding as my wife had to cancel at the last minute. All went well. Plenty of drinking, dancing, and pizza the size of my head. I walk into Penn Station just now and go to get a sandwich to eat on the train. I sit down and am about to unwrap it when a guy comes up to me. 5'9", maybe 90 pounds soaking wet and has the stereotypical shaved head with a beard. He gives me the impression of a generic traveler 
and something I can't quite figure out, giving me creepy vibes just all around. A messenger bag over his shoulder, he asks, Are you going to our city? To which I'm caught off guard and answer in the affirmative. This was my first mistake. He asks about my work, and I tell him short answers in an effort to get him to get bored with me. Nothing seems to work. He really wants to get to know me. Keep in mind, I don't have any friends or acquaintances who are like this. Any family members who have this personality, and I've never met this man in my entire life. Well, as far as I can tell. Finally, he asks if I like cooking. And I say yes. I tell him about my business, and he asks if I've ever been to whatever restaurant. I answered him. Yes, it was amazing. The wife and I went there a few months ago. This was my second mistake. Now, I get excited by talking food with anyone, whether it's cooking or eating or dreaming about food designs flavors, or the ways in which good food and teas can be medicine and help you feel wonderful after a long day, or relax you when you can't sleep, or get you ready for the day, or slow time for enjoyment during a break. I ended up getting worked up for a good 15 minutes just blabbing away. Looking back, it seemed like he was reading my body language and reactions while nervously looking around the station as if he's trying to see who else was listening. When he says, You don't remember me? We met at... Name of restaurant here. I squint as he says this in confusion, because it was only myself and my wife that night. I'm thinking that maybe it was our server, but how would the server remember me months later in a different city? He stops me to tell me this, and I realize that even though we have been chatting for this long, I still feel sick talking to him. He comments that the food scene in our city has been up and coming. He tells me his name like four times, slowly and parses out the syllables. He looks over at the police officers walking around and says in a low tone and a smirk, Good to meet you. He then walks towards the food court and yells back, I'll see you on the other train. Now, there's nothing on my clothing or bag that indicates that I lived in our city or worked there. All of my things still have the logos of my previous jobs or places I have volunteered at. As I walk on the platform, I'm trying to hide from him. I don't think I want this guy to sit next to me for 10 plus hours. I don't even know if he's on the train now, and I hope to not find out. I'll post a follow-up if necessary. Possible con artist and all-around creepy dude, let's never meet again. So, I work in a restaurant. One night, we were short-staffed, and I had to help on the floor. So the waitresses were just me, and a young girl called Anna, and our manager, David. Anna was 18, and an absolute knockout. On this cold, dreary Monday night, she still looked like a movie star. It wasn't too busy, so we were going okay. Towards the end of the evening, there were only a couple of tables left all in my section, so when the last table came in, he was put in Anna's section. The guy was a real hipster. He had a giant beard with a little braid in it. He ordered his meal and pulled out his own bottle of sriracha sauce. He had swallows tattooed on both hands. As Anna took his drink order, I shot her a look as if to say, (laughs) have fun with that guy. About 40 minutes later, Anna had gone for a smoke, so I asked the hipster dude if he wanted anything else. How about your friend's number? I laughed him off and he ordered a refill on his Pepsi. A little while later, Anna comes into the kitchen to find me. She told me that hipster dude had asked what time she got off work. 
She told him she could go when we closed. He told her he would wait for her shift to finish. She said no thank you. Hipster dude then said, well, these Pepsis are unlimited, so it doesn't look like you will be getting rid of me anytime soon. As Anna explained all of this, she looked very unsettled. I asked if she wanted to leave. She said no because her housemates wouldn't be back until late and she had forgotten her door key. So I found David, the manager, told him what had happened. He uselessly said he would keep an eye on things. I told the chefs that after Anna's ship, they were both going to walk her to the car. They agreed. Hipster dude left at around 10 minutes later. The night finally crawled to an end and Anna waited for the chefs to finish so that they could walk her to her car. I got changed and went over to the hotel next door to the restaurant because I needed to pick up some paperwork. As I crossed the car park, I noticed this van. It was black with rust on the side panels. It had blacked out windows. The headlights and engines were on. As I got to the other side of the van, I saw a hand hanging out of the window holding a cigarette. A hand with a swallow tattoo. I walked calmly towards the hotel and then sprinted around the building to the back entrance of the restaurant. I found Anna and the chef just getting ready to leave. He is still here. He's outside waiting in some creepy murder van. Don't go out there, I panted. Upon reflection, these probably weren't the right words to have used. Every one of us were panicking by now save for David, who was in the office. So we came up with a plan. Anna would stay inside by the door with one of the chefs. Me and the other chef would go out to the car park. I would drive Anna's car right up to the door, and she would get in and drive with one of the chefs back to her house. The chefs lived near her anyway. The plan went off without a hitch except for the fact that as soon as Anna's car pulled away, so did the creepy van. I start calling the chef in Anna's car frantically. He's following us, I said. He was, said the chef, but he just turned off. He is up behind us now. Relieved, I walked over to the hotel and spent about 20 minutes sorting out order forms and other paperwork. Help David lock up and then walk to my car. In the inky blackness of our restaurant car park, late at night, I heard the crunching of the gravel underfoot. Then, when I got to my car and stopped walking, the footsteps didn't stop. I heard it crunch, 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 and a whisper, why couldn't you just let me have her? I leapt into my car, locked the doors, and sped away. So, to start this off, I'm 16, haven't had a job yet. I really want to work. I need to get out of the house. I got an interview at a Popeye's in my city. I get there around five minutes before my interview. I have really, really bad social anxiety and struggle to speak in certain situations. By the time it was my turn to be interviewed, my nails had been gnawed off. I was very shaky. I could hear it in my voice. I had been listening to what the previous girl had said. I like examples of what to say or do. And so I thought I was ready. No masks were worn mid-COVID, and this man did not put on his mask. Red flag number one. He also was looking towards places where as I was trying to maintain eye contact. I had one of the mom cardigans on, so I crossed it over my chest. When I did, his attention finally fell back on my face, where it should be. Especially since I am a minor, and he knew that. He bit his lip a lot and would sigh weirdly. It was like a moan. 
obviously uncomfortable. I try to take his attention from me onto something random, like questions I started to ask about the restaurant and shit. He answered very dismissively. In the end, I got the job. I was told an email was going to be sent to me within the next day or two with my login info so I can get started on training. That's an important detail, by the way. I give it two days and I've received nothing. I call and they tell me to call back the next day at three because he's out of town. I go to high school full time and I don't get out until almost four. By the time I called, he had gone. I called multiple more times to no avail. I called that Saturday and he finally answers. He starts telling me how I was supposed to stay after the meeting and get my login info from the assistant manager. That's when I had had enough. I'm already very short tempered and I had given this man every ounce that I had. Listen man, I applied there and you said I was hired. You also said I would receive an email with my info. I was not given that or any other way to communicate with you urgently. Not to mention how unprofessional it is to lie to a new employee. You are an unprofessional man and a creep. I suggest you start focusing more on, excuse me ma'am, but I, no, you listen to me. Focus on hiring people and not the chests of obviously underage applicants. I told him to take my file out of their system and to fuck off. I hung up before he could say another word. Multiple emails were sent afterwards, belittling me and some extremely unprofessional behavior. I blocked the sender's email and still continued to receive more. Multiple calls were made to my own mother by this man. We reported him and he has since been fired. Note to all hiring managers, when you make a mistake, own up to it. Don't lie to new employees. We are not stupid. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. I'd like to take a moment and give a very special shout out to the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mee, Colt Stonewall, Patty's Niece, Chrissy Elliott, Tammy Slayton, Luz Crispin, CAG, Samantha Place, Denise S, Normie DW, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for keeping Back to Ashes alive and remaining a member of the channel. I truly appreciate you. If you are already sleeping, I hope Slumberland treats you comfortably. Or if you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.